Hello, I'm Bill Goodman, Executive Director of Kentucky Humanities. Welcome to the 2020 Kentucky Book Festival online. We're pleased you've taken the time to join us for this special program that brings together authors, readers, and literary enthusiasts from across the country and the Commonwealth, just like we've done for 39 years. All of our Kentucky Book Festival conversations would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Today, the Heinemann Settlement School is bringing you Understanding Appalachia, Journalistic Perceptions of a Region. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this discussion with Matthew Algio, Jeff Young, and Samantha Niekamp, in conversation with moderator Sidney Bowles. Thank you all for being here. Take it away, Sydney. Thanks, Bill. Appalachia means a lot of things to a lot of people. Is it a geography, a cultural heritage, a set of economic circumstances? I'd love it if each of you could describe how you understand Appalachia and how that idea shaped the book that you wrote. Maybe we'll start with you, Samantha. Thanks, Sydney. Um, I think of Appalachia primarily as a geographic constructs as an area difficult to move through and that being its defining feature that it stops a lot of people from going a lot of places um, or makes it more difficult. Um, my particular focus has always been on central Appalachia which um, as we know the ARC defines as eastern Kentucky, um, western West Virginia, and western Virginia. Um, as sort of the most difficult area to move through um, because of the physical geography. And so while the isolation of Appalachia is entirely overwrought, as I discuss in the book, um, these areas did have particular um, cultural geographies that mirrored those physical barriers. And I'm interested in teasing out uh, to what effect did those physical barriers influence the culture of the area? Uh, Matthew? Well, uh, I came at the book from a, kind of a different perspective. I, I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania, and I grew up near what we called the Appalachian Trail. And so my, my idea of, uh, of Kentucky as, as Appalachia was uh, a completely distinct region from where I grew up in Pennsylvania. And really doing the research for the book was my first experience, uh, spending much time in Eastern Kentucky, spending much time in Appalachia. And so uh, it, it, it was interesting to see how something that is considered a single region, like in terms of the Appalachian Regional Commission, is really so many different regions, uh, you know, within that, within that whole. And uh, it, 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 to me, it opened up my eyes. You know, my book takes place in 1968. It's about the trip that Robert Kennedy does to Eastern Kentucky in February of 68. So there's a lot going on in the world. And growing up in Pennsylvania, to me, the 60s were about Woodstock and San Francisco and researching this book. It was just hope in my eyes, you know, the 60s happened in Appalachia too. You know, there was incredible stuff going on in Eastern Kentucky in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, programs, uh, uh, the Appalachian Volunteers, uh, environmental protests. So there was so much going on that for me to grow up so close to the region in a way and yet know almost nothing about it was really uh, an eye-opening experience for me. And Jeff? Uh, so I would say uh, we uh, mirror some of the, the things that uh, Samantha and Matthew have talked about in the book Appalachian Fall, uh, but um, as journalists, the team that helped to make the book focused on Appalachia as a coal producing region and this moment for the coal industry. So uh, I would say to your question, it's about how coal has shaped the region, both in terms of the, uh, well, sometimes quite literally shaped it by blasting off mountaintops and such, uh, but also how it has shaped how we perceive ourselves in Appalachia and how others perceive Appalachia because of the uh, very dominant narratives that the industry uh, is very successful at, at imposing. Uh, we, we start the book with my recollection growing up in West Virginia and seeing this uh, ubiquitous television commercial where it had this um, 
swelling male chorus, coal is West Virginia, was the, that was the whole message of the ad. And, you know, that's a pretty powerful message when you're growing up in West Virginia. It's like, oh, it's either coal or nothing. And that narrative was wildly successful. And today we see other very successful narratives that the industry has imposed on the region. The Friends of Coal campaign, for example, has completely flipped the long narrative of labor versus industry. Now they're friends. Uh, and more recently, the war on coal narrative has really come to define the, the politics of the area. And so as journalists, we're trying to kind of examine those and uh, point out the limitations of those narratives. Yeah, thank you. Thanks all three of you. Um, I'll now direct a question to each of the panelists one at a time, um, Samantha, starting with you. You write, quote, despite President Trump's widespread support in many traditionally Republican states, as well as his support in purple Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, Appalachia became the testing ground for theories about, the, uh, for theories about his appeal and the perceived epicenter of his support. It was, as one reporter dubbed it, the symbolic heart of Trump's white working class base, end quote. But of course, 2016 wasn't the first time that reporters ventured into Appalachia to document this perceived other. So can you tell us a little bit about why we consider Appalachia to be somewhat apart from the rest of the country and why that matters? So my book begins in 1885, which I've chosen that date because it is really the beginning of Appalachia as a narrative construct, as, um, as a region that exists as somehow different than the rest of the country. This is traditionally attributed to uh, local color writers. Um, so um, in the Tennessee mountains, is, it comes out in 1884. And so 1885, when that book is really, really hitting the shelves, um, marks the, the invention of Appalachia, as Henry Shapiro has put it. I, I would go further than that and say that Appalachia as a construct needed to exist in response to the um, immigrant influx beginning around 1880. Um, as the immigrants um, start to arrive at our shores, one of the arguments for not letting them in is a literacy-based argument uh, that um, we, we can't have this, this mass of illiterate people teeming to our shores. Uh, but that argument doesn't really hold up if Appalachia is an illiterate region as the local color writers are starting to figure it. And so there becomes this tension that in an area that in many ways has defined the United States up till now, we're a frontier country, Appalachia is the frontier. Um, if it's not embodying these perceived American qualities, then there, there's sort of a problem. And so it becomes necessary to define Appalachia as an other to the rest of America in order for um, other narratives of America to make sense. If that makes, if that makes sense. Um, so, so I think that the reason that the Appalachian narrative really catches on, instead of just going the way of many other, um, many other creations uh, in literature, is that, that that it really serves a larger narrative around immigration and literacy. If I can just follow up on that. Um... I think a lot these days about this idea of um, people voting against their own interest, which is something that we hear quite a bit from, you know, honestly sort of coastal elites to use a term that gets thrown around a whole heck of a lot. Um, but to me, that fits into this whole narrative about Appalachia that we've seen for a very long time. Do you see it that way? Do you see that as a continuation of the history you're describing? I do. I do see it as a continuation of that. So Appalachia has always been defined in a way by its non-eliteness. Um, everyone in Appalachia has been imagined as poor and backward rather than recognizing that there's social stratification in Appalachia just as there is uh, anywhere else. Right, those, those class distinctions have been collapsed, right? And racial distinctions have often been 
political apps. Um, Appalachia is all white in, in the popular imagination, right? when in fact um, it, it, it's a vibrant culture with many, many different kinds of, kinds of inputs. So yes, I, I would say that, that that's a continuation of, of a narrative that really begins in the 1880s. Yeah. Um, Matthew, if we can move over to you, um, your book, All This Marvelous Potential, meticulously traces Robert F. Kennedy's 1968 tour of Appalachia. And you write that Kennedy found divisive politics and environmental devastation and racism and economic uncertainty, much like Lyndon B. Johnson described in, in his tour years earlier and much like we still face today. Is there a particular stop on Kennedy's tour that can help us understand why these challenges persist despite decades of, of attempted interventions of various kinds? Uh, I, I guess it. I guess it's. Um, it comes down. It comes down to two for me. Um, stopped at a strip mine in uh, near the town of Vico. And he also held a hearing at Fleming Neon High School in the town of Neon, now Fleming Neon. And I really think those two stops kind of epitomized, you know, crystallized a lot of the issues that, uh, that were going on at the time. You know, obviously strip mining had become a major environmental concern um, and, uh, and it had become a political issue as well. And then when he goes to have the hearing, he was kind of a one man uh, Senate committee traveling. He was supposed to be accompanied by another Senator who got, who got ill. So it was just Bobby Kennedy by himself holding these hearings in gymnasiums and, and one room schoolhouses and that sort of thing. But the thing that really uh, kind of blew me away was the uh, hearing he held at Fleming Neon High School, which was attended by a high school youth group called the Cloverfort Youth Group. And they were from Everett's, Kentucky. And uh, they came to the hearing. They were a, a, a youth group that was funded by the Appalachian Volunteers, which was, had sort of morphed into this big government program in the space of like five or six years. I think they started in 62, repairing schoolhouses. And really when the war on poverty came along, they got funding from the federal government that went directly to youth groups like this. So there was a, a paid professional, a woman who uh, oversaw the youth group, but the kids really ran everything and they had a newspaper there and they were in the newspaper describing some of the shortcomings of the school uh, in Everett's, the high school. And the kids had to, there were three different buildings in the middle of winter. You had to walk between the classes. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of dust from the tipple across the street. It wasn't, you know, they were just exposing things. Well, the, the local uh, uh, power structure really came down on these kids and kind of made their life miserable, including the principal of the high school. Well, they went to this hearing that Kennedy held and stood outside holding big signs. One of them said, we can't eat your fancy promises. And this really caught Kennedy's attention. And he, he wanted to know more about this. And he invited the kids in and actually asked one of the, the leader of the group, a guy named Tommy Duff, he was 17 at the time, and asked him to testify at this hearing pretty much spontaneously, they hadn't planned on testifying. And Tommy went up and, and uh, testified, I think quite eloquently about the problems uh, that Kennedy or that the, the, you know, the kids and Everts were facing. And uh, it just sort of encapsulated uh, a lot of what was going on at the time, both the, the problems, but also the hope that these kids were putting their heart and soul into this youth group in Everts. And you know, in 1968, you know, in Everett's people told me you were lucky if you could get the station from Johnson City to come in. There wasn't a lot to do. Uh, and, and so this really became a focus for them by putting their energy into this really positive program. I'm probably talking too much, but I, I just really was impressed by the way that the kids uh, were so uh, involved and active and so positive too. Yeah, and, and um, you mentioned the Vico stop as well. Right, right. So this was, uh, uh, Bill Sturgill was a big mine owner at the time. He owned a bunch of mines in eastern Kentucky. And he really, uh, he, he was the guy who uh, uh, kind of took strip mining up another notch, developed some of the biggest earth movers, some of the biggest augers, and it really became possible to move huge amounts of earth and do these massive strip mines. This is in the 50s and into the 60s. And so Kennedy wanted to see this. And Sturgill didn't want Kennedy to, Kennedy to see it. So Kennedy drove up to the mine, but there was a guard there who said you couldn't go up. Well, Bobby Kennedy wasn't about to tell some guard there tell him he couldn't go up. So they eventually talked their way up. 
And I think it was probably, I mean, I, I, I know it was the only time that Kennedy actually saw an operation like that up close. And, you know, the Kennedys had campaigned in 1960 in West Virginia. Bob, uh, John ran for president in the primary, very important. Bobby was the campaign manager. So they were acquainted, I think, with uh, uh, poverty and, and Appalachian poverty in particular and the issues that were important to the people in Appalachia. But I think this was Kennedy's first up close experience at seeing how uh, an operation like this really worked. And, you know, the book um, uh, Night Comes to the Cumberlands had just come out uh, about five years earlier. Uh, Kennedy was a fan. He had read the book. And so I think this was really an eye-opening experience for Bobby Kennedy when he went up there and saw, uh, you know, the equipment moving and basically slowly dismantling uh, this mountain uh, on uh, Yellow Creek uh, near Vico. Yeah, thank you. Um... Jeff, Appalachian Fall is in some ways a continuation of, of the themes explored in, in Matthew's book, describing the reality on the ground today. But you argue that Appalachia is not some stubbornly anti-progressive backwater like we might have been taught to believe, but rather it's a bellwether for uh, what, what's to come for the country as a whole. Um, if you would, can you talk about the ways in which Appalachia leads the way, both in experiencing harms and finding solutions to them? So um, I, I think uh, the, the three of us are all um, pursuing similar themes here in that uh, we're trying to point out that, you know, Appalachia is really not this separate country inside a country. Uh, it is an integrated part of the United States and the things that happen in Appalachia matter very much for the rest of the country. And um, the argument that we're trying to make in Appalachian Fall is that is especially true now. Um, a few examples I think would be uh, climate change and whether or not we are going to successfully make a transition to a clean energy economy as a country. Uh, I personally argue that we can't do that. And as long as uh, large segments of the population feel that they are going to be the losers in that transition. And that essentially is the dominant uh, feeling, at least expressed through electoral politics, uh, throughout the coal producing regions of Appalachia. Uh, this brings up the concept of a just transition as a necessary part of a clean energy transition, recognizing the contributions that uh, the coal producing region has uh, given to the rest of the country and the need to make whole uh, the damages that are left behind by the coal industry now that it's in collapse. Um, also, uh, well, I'll, I'll just I'll just go with the Kennedy theme on that. You know, I once uh, heard uh, uh, RFK Jr. talk about the first time that he uh, did a flyover of mountaintop removal mines in southern West Virginia, and uh, he came out of that saying, you know, uh, there are some people who, and I'm paraphrasing, there are some people who would say that um, I'm a socialist because I want them to pay for what they're doing, but really. That is capitalism as it should be practiced. Uh, what he was trying to get across, I think, is that the coal industry has uh, been very good at externalizing the true costs of its business onto us, the public, uh, in the forms of uh, pollution and damage to the landscape and water and now damage to the atmosphere. Uh, so. Um, th those externalities are now things that are impediments to our ability to make a transition to a clean energy economy. That's not an Appalachian problem. That's an American problem. The other quick example that I would give is um, the opioid crisis. I think our inability to uh, recognize the opioid crisis in its early form when it hit first and hardest in uh, central Appalachia, where I grew up, uh, was kind of ground zero for the early phase of the opioid crisis, uh, I think is uh, largely because of these persistent stereotypes that Samantha was uh, describing earlier. Uh, so long as Appalachia is viewed as this separate entity with people who are somehow less than, uh, then it's very easy to blame their uh, ills on them, to make them the, you know, the, the victims of their own uh, bad choices and behaviors. Uh, if, on the other hand, we had uh, viewed the early rise of OxyContin abuse as um, a medical and public health issue, as it is, instead of saying, oh, it's hillbilly heroin, what are you going to do? Uh, we could have uh, prevented uh, something that is now a, a national crisis 
causing so many deaths that it is part of this uh, wave of deaths of despair, which is actually bending downward the longevity curve of the entire nation. So um, those are just a couple of examples, and I think there are many others in our changing labor force and in our politics and society where we can look to Appalachia as sort of the leading edge. And we can look to how communities in Appalachia are responding to these issues for the seeds of solutions. The challenge, I think, is how we scale those up to meet the level of the challenge. Yeah, thank you all uh, for, those, for those answers. Um, I guess I'll have each of you take a stab at this next question and I'll, I'll go in reverse order this time. Um, in some ways, I think um, each of you are, are in different ways writing or thinking about um, the battle sort of for a narrative about Appalachia. And each of you have touched on this a little bit in your answers already. Um, I was specifically interested, Matthew, in your writing on uh, the Mountain Eagle, my hometown paper here in Whitesburg, Kentucky, and its uh, incredible, incredible motto, it screams. Um, you were writing about the ways that uh, for many years, decades, uh, journalism and storytelling was in some ways corrupted by corporate and political interests and, and the impact that that had on uh, the stories that were able to be told about this region. Um, actually, yeah, I, I said I was going to go in reverse order, but now that we're on Matthew, maybe I'll start with you. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you think about that, that battle for the narrative about Appalachia in your work? Yeah, um, I guess I was bound to go for sooner or later. Uh, I, I really was impressed, obviously, with, uh, you know, the work that the, the Gishes had done and have done with the Mountain Eagle in, uh, in Whitesburg. You know, as I, as I uh, was doing research and I would go to each of the towns that Kennedy went to and I would uh, go to the, you know, the, the local library and try to find the newspaper coverage, the local newspaper coverage of the Kennedy visit, I was really surprised that in some places they barely even mentioned that Bobby Kennedy had come to their town. Um, and uh, I think that's because that, as you mentioned, the local newspapers were often uh, beholden to local interests. Um, and it could be that a lot of the newspaper's income would be from publishing legal notices. And so they didn't want to alienate anyone in the local power structure. And so they were reluctant to ruffle feathers. And of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the Mountain Eagle was a, didn't care about that. They just went out and did what they wanted to do. Um, so it was interesting to see kind of how the local filter was on, on the news and how the, the narrative at the local level was kind of controlled that way. And then you had people who would, of course, famously um, uh, parachute in. Uh, Homer, Homer Biggert was a reporter for the New York Times who uh, came into Eastern Kentucky in 63, I believe it was, and did a expose that ran in the uh, Times uh, that, that fall. Uh, that caught John Kennedy's attention. But Homer, when he came in, he would go stay with the Gishes in Whitesburg, and then, and then the Gishes would show him around. Uh, to, to, so, so even the national story kind of got filtered through this local lens uh, of, of the Gishes and, and uh, uh, Ben Gish, who was just a, a young boy at the time, but he's the manager of the paper, now the editor of the paper, he remembers, you know, all these reporters would, would, would come in, uh, Charles Kuralt and Homer Biggert and all the major newspapers. And so um, there are so many different competing narratives and then you have to factor in who's got, whose interests in mind in, in controlling the narrative. Um, you know, and Jeff probably knows, but there was a big public relations push in the late 60s about strip mining and they would put out these uh, ads that would run in the paper that would show, you know, apple orchards, you know, app, the apple orchards are going to make more money. We're going to make more money off apples than coal in this land. And they, and they would publish all these things. It was, it was acquired media, you know, it was purchased media, but it's still media. People saw it. And so, uh, you know, power, money, uh, and media, they create the narrative. And sometimes, uh, you know, people at the, uh, you know, ordinary people uh, are left out of that equation. Yeah, Jeff, that's fascinating. Um, my reporter brain is is firing on all cylinders, thinking about sort of modern iterations of that that um, 
apple farm story, right? We've got Enter Blue and, and all these sort of modern boondoggles that, that we've been documenting at the Ohio Valley Resource that are very similar in terms of messaging. Um, right. Um, they would, I love they would to do the photographs. What is that? I always get the word wrong. Potemkin Village? It's Potemkin Village? Where they, you know, they would take the photographs so you couldn't see that half of the mountain had been take it off. You just see the lush, you know, they one acre of trees in there, but that, you know, again, literally framing the picture to determine how people, you know, view. Does anyone else feel compelled to, to add to the, this conversation around uh, sort of this battle for the narrative? Um, I'll chime in and say that one of the really interesting things that I found is that even as early as 1890, uh, we see in these Eastern Kentucky newspapers that my book is really looking at, we see the local Appalachian writers responding to the narrative that's being developed about them, um, that they're very aware that they're being depicted in these ways and that this narrative is being born and they're trying their darndest in these local papers to talk back to it. Um, so, for instance, one community that um, is at three miles away from the nearest school, um, it, so they band together, take up funds, and uh, fund their own teacher right, in, in one of the, the local houses. And as they're announcing that they're doing this, they make a point to announce that they're telling you this because they don't want you to think that their children are unschooled represented in the northern papers right mm -hmm. um so so the reason that it's worthy of announcing in the newspaper is to talk back to the narratives that are, are being created around them mm -hmm. it's also really interesting to see the the ways in which um the breathitt county news for instance is responding to the way that the violence there um during the bloody breath at years um is being represented in the new york times so they respond very directly to how the new york times is reporting on these issues so i i just think it's really fascinating that um the level of awareness that's there um really speaks to the fact that this region was never isolated and was always trying to participate in the narrative creation and just couldn't break through because the forces behind that narrative were ultimately so powerful. Boy, do we see the continuation of that now. Um, you know, just a, a couple months now, I think the uh, Hillbilly Elegy movie will come out. I think it's a Netflix production now. Um, and of course the response to J.D. Vance's book uh, was really similar to what you were just describing with um, local folks uh, saying, really? That's because uh, not just the power of, of the book itself, but the fact that uh, J.D. Vance then became the sort of a Sherpa for helping coastal elites understand Trump country as defined by- uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> sure. I, yeah. I think I stole it from somewhere else, so feel free. Um, so uh, there, there was a lot of resentment around, you know, not just Vance's depiction, but also that he kind of became the sole voice for telling the rest of America what was going on in Appalachia. And as I like to point out, you grew up in Middletown, Ohio, which isn't really Appalachia, but <laughs> let's leave that aside for a moment. So um, there is, I think, still this kind of fierce battle to, you know, who gets to tell the story here? And even I, you know, feel some of that, that backlash. Uh, you know, I grew up in West Virginia, but I left. You know, I, I went to New England for a while. You know, so did I lose my right to tell the stories here? <laughs> you know? um, there are all sorts of uh, interesting discussions like that, but they really matter because we need a diversity of uh, ideas about what the narrative is here in order to, you know, better get a full understanding. And, you know, to Matthew's point, this notion of um, uh, journalists from elsewhere who come into this region, depending on locals, to kind of be their fixer and connect with, with local populations. You know, a Cottle who wrote um, A Night Comes to the Cumberland, uh, people would stay at his house. And uh, I think today of people like Jack Freck in uh, Athens, uh, Ohio, who kind of uh, has for a long time played that role for a lot of reporters to uh, 
see uh, portions of communities and also solutions that are underway. And that's the part that I think is too often missing from the story that gets told, is there is a, a huge focus on the problems and the people are largely depicted as just hapless victims of circumstance. When in fact, there is so much going on, but it is outside, increasingly now, I think, outside of standard institutions and standard expressions of that voting. We talked about earlier how this is depicted as Trump country, right? <clears throat> True, uh, 420 counties in Appalachia and all but 18, I think, went for Trump. But if you take a look at those vote numbers, what really stands out is not the people who voted for Trump. What really stands out is the people who don't vote. McDowell County, West Virginia was held up at story after story in national media as the example of Trump country, white working class, you know, coal producing region voting for Trump. Uh, they, they had pathetically low voter turnout, the lowest voter turnout in all of West Virginia. West Virginia had the second lowest voter turnout of any state in the country in 2016. People in Appalachia, by and large, just don't vote. They are, however, seriously, deeply engaged in other forms of active expression for their communities. You know, Sydney documented a, a month plus of people sitting out on railroad tracks, you know, direct action. I think it's largely because the institutions have not delivered for people in Appalachia and they've kind of given up on them. Uh, why would I work for democracy by going to vote if democracy is not working for me? And they're finding other ways, more direct ways to express their uh, creativity and their hope for their communities. They're collaborating together in ways that are outside of institutions and it's harder for people outside of the region to recognize those. But it's very important to recognize those because I deeply believe those are the seeds of solutions. Staying on this, this topic of um, both narratives and elections, um, we are three weeks out from another presidential election, um, another cycle of national, national media looking at Appalachia to try to divine something about our nation's spirit in some way. Uh, have we learned anything from 2016? What do you see uh, as better? What do you see as, as ongoing challenges? Um, I guess we'll see what we've learned. Um, I, you know, I, I do see a lot of uh, local attention uh, in response to uh, the depictions of the region in, in 2016. Um, and there's a funny dynamic going on where uh, the um, legacy media, if you will, newspapers are, have sadly still not found the bottom of their long free fall. Uh, we've seen the sharp contraction of what used to be dominant voices in regional media like the Charleston Gazette, the Louisville Courier Journal, the Lexington Herald Leader, et cetera. Uh, the flip side of that though, is we've seen a lot of activity in the nonprofit realm. And yes, this is a self-serving statement for me because we are a nonprofit uh, journalism outlet in public media, but there are lots of others uh, starting up as well. And some that have started up uh, expressly to try to uh, correct the, what they perceive as uh, you know, imperfect narratives that are being told by offering advice to other uh, journalism outlets that visit and report on the region. So those are very, very hopeful signs. Um, in terms of this uh, trend in reporting, political reporting about the region that you mentioned earlier, this strong uh, dominant narrative of voting against your own interest, that's a really tough one and uh, a very persistent thing that we see almost weekly in the comments on our stories as they're presented on social media. You know, something like, people can't get drinking water in Martin County, Kentucky. And the response that we'll get from so many readers is, well, what did they expect? They voted for Trump. So, Come on, that's not how water systems work. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? And yet that is a very uh, common and persistent thing that comes from largely uh, people who I think consider themselves kind of woke liberals. Uh, so take from that what you will. Um, but I think, uh, some reporting uh, on the region is beginning to show a more nuanced view. Um, so I do see some, some progress there. 
Matthew, what do you see us um, getting right in terms of growth around this issue of, of narratives and, and, and Appalachia and, and what growth do we still have remaining? Uh, I think one, well, one good thing that came out of the Vance book, Hillbilly Elegy, I think, is that there was a very, uh, there was a good amount of, I guess, backlash literature <laughs> that came out. And I'm thinking about, uh, you know, uh, Elizabeth Catt, uh, what you're getting wrong about Appalachia, where, by the way, she does an excellent job of really parsing the numbers of people who voted. And just like Jeff was talking about, if you look at expressed as a percentage of a particular county or something, it's a very small percentage. So I, I think uh, something else that, uh, that, that uh, was mentioned is this idea of uh, passive versus active. And I think as I did the research for my book and looking back at uh, 1968 in my own, you know, preconception going in is that this was going to be a very passive uh, environment. Things were happening to the people in Eastern Kentucky. And then as I did the research, of course, I, as I mentioned earlier, it just was mind blowing to me to see how active people were. And I think since 2016, and this is just based on, you know, I'm just some schmuck, I, you know, from Pennsylvania, but that there seems to be um, a, a resurgence of that kind of activeness, um, activity. You see it in, you know, kind of the, you know, the usual suspects in environmental uh, but I think, uh, you know, LGBTQ community, you see much more uh, uh, activity there, uh, you know, typically underrepresented groups, much more activity. So I'm hopeful that that might translate into some kind of substantial political change. But like Jeff said, as, as, as long as, um, you know, people don't vote, you, you, you won't see that. You won't see that change immediately. I would say that I'm somewhat encouraged that as I survey the national media landscape, it seems as though we are not the dominant narrative this time around. And by we, I mean Appalachia. So we, we haven't become the outpost for every national news outlet to come and find a Trump voter to interview right, in the way that we were in 2016 and I find that I find that encouraging there seems to be a recognition that they they exist everywhere right? not just here um, so so I do find that encouraging and I think that some of that is linked to the fact that we now have a democratic governor um, and so the election of Andy Bashir has made it more difficult to present this narrative of a monolithic Republican region um, in Kentucky and in larger sort of central Appalachia. Uh, and the success of Kentucky to some degree during the early stages of the coronavirus also um, reset the narrative in a small way, but one that I find encouraging, right? That, um, that there, there is a little bit of a counter narrative happening in 2020 that wasn't there in 2016 when when the region was able to be painted as more of a monolith. The last question I'll, I'll have for, for each of you is, is a forward looking one. Um, based on the research that you've done, based on each of your understandings of this, this amorphous thing we call Appalachia, um, what are one or two really concrete uh, things that you might recommend that could help create this flourishing Appalachia that we all, I assume, would like to see? The concrete thing that I call for in the book is a reassessment of the history of Appalachia because uh, so much of the current reporting around Appalachia relies on this idea of cyclical poverty, right? Cyclical problems that we'll never be able to really fix the region because it's always been like this. And so it's kind of, it's kind of hopeless. And anytime an intervention fails, uh, the arrow is pointed backwards to say, well, it was doomed to failure, right? Rather than looking at the actual structural issues with that particular intervention, right? So while on the one hand, it might seem as though a historical approach wouldn't make that big of a difference, right? How many people are sitting around reading books about Appalachian history? I do think that having a richer sense 
of the history of the region would help inform um, many of these agencies that are attempting to implement change in Appalachia. If we had a more accurate sense of what has and hasn't worked in the past, then we could have a more accurate sense of what will work moving forward. Uh, Jeff. Um, so uh, there are enormous challenges and, you know, as journalists, we can't shy away from what is um, happening in, in the region and the um, really big issues here. Uh, however, I think that there are um, areas of surprising bipartisan agreement on things that could be uh, pathways to large scale solutions. Uh, and then there's another one that I'll talk about in a moment where there unfortunately is not bipartisan agreement, but somewhat counterintuitively, uh, a strong environmental program might uh, be just what Appalachia needs. I'll start with the, the areas of agreement. Uh, infrastructure spending. You know, the joke with the Trump administration is, oh, it's infrastructure week again. Uh, but just behind that, the, the politics that could happen, there is really strong bipartisan support for a robust infrastructure investment. Uh, it would require deficit spending, uh, which is, you know, going to involve some Keynesian economics making some headway uh, in Washington, D.C., but there is uh, an appetite for large-scale uh, 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 infrastructure investment, and there is certainly need for large-scale uh, infrastructure in uh, our region. Just look at the, the drinking water system that I mentioned in Martin County and the many others like it all over the region. Just look at the lack of broadband uh, in infrastructure that is uh, holding back these communities as they try to reinvent themselves. I mean, imagine you're Martin County and your coal economy, which has been the bedrock of your jobs and revenue for a century, is essentially collapsing around your ears. And now you're told, well, you know, just reinvent your local economy. Oh, by the way, you can't deliver a clean glass of water to your people and you don't have broadband internet. Good luck with that in the 21st century, right? So infrastructure instantly creates jobs, instantly stimulates the local economies and positions them to be uh, more competitive down the road. That's a really strong one. Um, where does all the money come from though? This brings me to the uh, counterintuitive solution by embracing climate change as a real urgent thing, which it is. <laughs> um, where would the money come from? Well, if we had a robust uh, pricing of carbon emissions and we had a policy that redirected that into a just transition, there are many uh, analysts, including some at Brookings who have really uh, been digging into this, who show that that could be a major source of revenue for coal dependent communities, which are currently in a complete fiscal death spiral. It's not just the jobs. It's the revenue that pays for the schools, the revenue that pays for all the government services has been completely yanked out from under these communities with the collapse of coal. And uh, there's nothing immediately on the horizon that's going to replace that at the scale that's needed. We need large scale, multi-billion dollar regular investment in these communities. And I think that a uh, climate change uh, policy that includes as a central component, this concept of a just transition for coal country uh, is our best shot. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Matthew, anything, anything on, um, from you on, on what it would take for us to, to get to this flourishing Appalachia? Yeah, I, I mean, I, in the meta, I'm a big fan of uh, universal basic income. Uh, I think it would lift, uh, immediately lift people, uh, raise the standard of living and help the economy. Um, at the same time, you look at some of the big programs, and I love what Samantha was saying about understanding the history. And if you look at the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is sort of uh, envisioned as uh, something along the Tennessee Valley Authority, but never really, uh, uh, well, not even really, it just never, you know, never realized that potential and why was that and the politics involved in it. And I think if we understand why some of these programs didn't work, um, it would go a long way towards helping us find solutions for the future with problem or with, uh, you know, programs that will work. I, I think uh, one of the things that I was uh, really struck by with the War on Poverty programs was that there was direct funding of local grassroots organizations. I mean, the federal government 
gave money um, to uh, to uh, co-ops in uh, in Letcher County. They gave money to to student youth groups like the one in Everett's. Um, this, of course made a lot of people angry because local politicians often were the gatekeepers for these kinds of federal funds and it bypassed them. And that was one of the reasons that the, you know, a lot of these grassroots programs were defunded uh, in the war on poverty. And in fact, why the war on poverty itself then was gradually ramped down. So um, I, I, I think if you can get money right to people, that goes a long way to improving their lives. And also let's not forget one of the things that uh, Kennedy learned when he was on his trip was that people had to pay for food stamps in, in 1968. It wasn't until 1977 that people were just given food stamps. You've had to pay, uh, it was a sliding scale depending on how many kids you had. You might have to pay $50 to get $100 worth of food stamps. Some people couldn't afford to pay the $50 to get $100 worth of food stamps. So, uh, uh, you know, adjusting a program to make sure it works, you know, for the best for all the people. At the same time, uh, Food stamps, you have to remember today, 4% of Walmart's revenue is from food stamps. Food stamps are not just a program to help people buy food. They're a program to help Walmart, uh, you know. So uh, there are probably solutions here that would satisfy, uh, that, that could satisfy corporate America and satisfy, uh, you know, me the needs that people have. And AI, where will all that money go? Well, it's going to it's gonna go to Walmart. It's going to go to businesses. And so I think that's, that's something to consider. And again, funding uh, local organizations, give them the money to, to solve their own problems, found co-ops. People were paving roads with money from the War on Poverty program by themselves. Um, so there are ways that you can, you can do, you can, you can do it. You can improve things. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Um, before we wrap up, we have two quick questions from, from the audience, which is exciting. Um, and I'll, I'll take them both at the same time, if that's all right with everyone. Um, real quick, let's just have each of you um, describe your, your book in a few sentences and then um, recommend one or two books other than your own um, to, uh, that you would suggest to people who want to learn about Appalachia. Uh, Matthew, we'll start with you. Uh, my book uh, is, well, look, I ha have it right here. Uh, <laughs> my book is called All This Marvelous Potential, Robert Kennedy's 1968 Tour of Appalachia. And um, yeah, that's it pretty much. It's about Kennedy's tour in 1968. He spent two days in Eastern Kentucky and, uh, and it looks at what the times were like then and how things have changed, how things haven't changed since 1968. The, the, the thing that was uh, cool about it for me is that rather than being a book about Kennedy, it's more a book about the people uh, that he met with and had interactions and experience with him on this trip. And then I was able to find a lot of people 50 years later who really remembered, you know, this was a, a big event in a lot of people's lives, meeting Robert Kennedy. And so I think the book, I, I tried to tell the book through the eyes of the people who saw Kennedy in 1968, not really through Kennedy's eyes. Uh, the two books, I guess, one I mentioned already, which I think, what you're getting wrong about Appalachia is that the is that how it is? I think that's a title, Elizabeth Katz book, um, and I hate to uh, <laughs> uh, to, to to say night comes to the Cumberlands, but really uh, to get an understanding of where people were coming from 50 years ago, I think you need to read that book. A lot of it's dated. Uh, there are parts that'll make you cringe. Um, you know, I don't think Harry Caudill was the most uh, you know. No, he didn't use a lot of footnotes, let's say. Harry, Harry's sources would sometimes be some guy he talked to. But I mean, I think that's part of the charm of the book. And I think we, we talk about the narrative and helping set the narrative. I think that book went a long way towards, you know, setting the narrative in 1963. And, um, and I think Elizabeth's book really sets a lot of things right um, from that, uh, what did you call him? The Sherpa? From the Sherpa. <laughs> Yes, uh, your book That's and a couple answer. of books you recommend. So uh, I too have our book. <laughs> uh, Appalachian Fall is a, a collective effort uh, by the Ohio Valley Resource. I'm the managing editor. Sydney is one of the reporters who contributed material for the book. And um, it's uh, drawn from three and a half years or so of reporting um, primarily in coal dependent communities in uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, and uh, southeastern Ohio. And we venture a little bit outside of Appalachia to go over to Muhlenberg County in western Kentucky and look at uh, 
uh, coal uh, over there. And we spend some time looking at uh, the uh, power dynamics, both literal power and political power at play in southeastern Ohio with the rise of the new petrochemical industry that could come from uh, the fracking industry. Uh, mostly what emerges from this is a picture of an industry in collapse. Uh, coal, this is the end game for coal, essentially. A lot of people would argue that there's a coal comeback. We see zero evidence of that. Um, so that's uh, another example of the, the political narrative about the region being at odds with the facts as we see them. Um, so the question is, what's next? Uh, what will happen? Will uh, the country um, treat this region that has fueled the country, that has helped to build the country, as disposable now that that fuel is no longer needed and we're looking elsewhere? And if that is the attitude, uh, what are the implications for the country if we just treat large regions of the country and its people as, uh, as, as expendable? Uh, on the flip side, we look at people who very much feel that there is a bright future here and are working to try to create a different, a different uh, future. Um, it is not a history. It's, well, you know, journalists like to say we're writing the first rough draft of history. So I guess this is a first rough draft of the next history of Appalachia uh, in, in process. Um, but we, we tried very much to be informed by uh, the history as we were writing about it. And I learned a lot through the research. Um, two who were especially helpful to me uh, would be uh, Eller's uh, Uneven Ground, which is a history of Appalachia, and uh, John Alexander Williams' uh, Appalachia a History, uh, both of which um, were very helpful to me to understanding, uh, better understanding the, the place where I grew up. Thank you. And Samantha, we'll finish up with you. So my book, I do not have it in arm's reach, unfortunately. It is currently trapped in my office where I have not been since the coronavirus <laughs> began. Um, so unfortunately, uh, but it is Literacy in the Mountains, Community Newspapers and Writing in Africa. And what I am doing in the book is looking at five newspapers published in Eastern Kentucky. Um, so they're based in Louisa, Hazel Green, um, Spout Springs, which is ne next to Clay City, which is the other one that I have, um, and then Barberville um, and uh, Jackson in Breathitt County. Um, and what, I, what I'm doing is basically reading those newspapers from 1880 to 1920, or as long as they last, they don't all quite make it that far. And I'm looking for evidence of literacy, right? Literacy practices and finding that this is a much more vibrant, educated, literate community than what the national narrative would tell us, right? And a community that's really writing back to that narrative. So this idea that this area has always been impoverished, has always been unschooled, um, all of these narratives really don't hold up when we actually look at what people are doing uh, during the period when this narrative is first being articulated um, and the ways in which they're speaking back to it. Um, as for books that I would recommend, um, I would say uh, Rereading Appalachia is a study that really inspired mine. It's an edited collection, so it's coming at the question of what uh, reading and writing have meant in Appalachia and mean today. Um, from, from a variety of different angles. Um, and then uh, Miners, Mill Hands, and Mountaineers, which uh, as Jeff was saying, it's another of, of Eller's books, uh, but as specifically about the period from 1880 to 1930, um, again, when this narrative is first being articulated. Um, and along the lines of what Matthew was saying, I would also say that Reading Yesterday's People by Jack Weller because it will illuminate anything it, but as a as a useful historical window into the ways that these problematic narratives are recapitulated. Um, so for instance, Weller has a, a lovely chart of characteristics of the Appalachian versus the normal American, right? And it reads exactly as a list of Trump voters 
versus non-Trump voters. <laughs> like you, you could just change the heading on the chart and it would, it would sort of fit perfectly. So it's more, it's more about um, obviously creating an other than it is about any kind of accurate depiction of, of a particular individual. Wow, that's a, I gotta, I gotta check that out. Um, well, uh, Samantha, Matthew, uh, Jeff, thank you very much for, for joining us today. It was, it was fascinating to get to talk to each of you. Sydney, Matthew, Jeff, and Samantha, thanks for being a part of today's program. And once again, thanks to our sponsor, the Heinemann Settlement School. We also want to thank you for joining us for this 2020 Kentucky Book Festival online event. If you're interested in purchasing one of the books discussed today, please visit our independent bookstore partner, Joseph Beth Booksellers at josephbeth.com. For a complete schedule of Kentucky Book Festival conversations, visit kyhumanities.org and follow us on social media at kyhumanities. For Kentucky Humanities, I'm Bill Goodman.